Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Bonjour, welcome to La Podcast. Oh, it is once again time for La Podcast. Uh, my name is Eric, and sitting with me is uh, masochist, sadomasochist, <laughs> Thank Michael you. Kester. Thank you for that. And we have uh, a two will films. to live. Yeah, we, we have. Do. I'm not sure if we do anymore. <laughs> We have to, it's it's just so hard to do this fucking show. It'll be fine, man. Oh, God, wait till people hear what we're doing next week. Okay, so we have two films we're doing yeah. on the show today. Sure. And uh, we're, we're doing some French movies, Yeah, it's like I a guess. French existentialism thing. Is that what it is? Sure. <laughs> we're doing, All right, Michael, so what are we doing on the show gonna today? We're going to do uh, Jean-Pierre Junet's Amelie and Pascal Logier's Martyrs. So this border's dangerously close to uh end of the year perversion Mm -hmm. this is uh i mean all right so here was the idea ready i'm gonna give you the elevator pitch uh i'm interested in the new french extreme and i want to know about you know we mentioned this flick martyrs a while back i've been trying to get people to watch with me strangely no one would watch it all these people had already seen it when it came out and refused to even talk to me about it weird okay that's weird But, you know, I had a couple people tell me, hey, have you seen Martyrs? You know, now that I think back, no one ever said, you should really see it. I they, said that. They, uh, you did. But I remember, someone will have to go back and listen. I think I was on that Killer Review show, and I don't know if it made air or not, but I remember that guy saying, you should really see Inside. That might go good with Martyrs. And then there was a pause, and he would say, have you seen Martyrs? <laughs> <laughs> And I don't think anyone wanted to be the one to tell me because then I would come back to them. Uh, and you told me, so yeah. it's just your fault. Uh, all right. So wanted to do martyrs on the show. Yeah. Now you had told me martyrs a little bit heavy, a little Pretty heavy, yeah, a little hard. Sure. Right? But it's damn French. It's definitely so, fucking French. So I said, yeah, right. <laughs> if you want new French extreme, I mean, come on. Yep. So uh, so I said, all right. Why don't we do? Amelie. Yeah. Because we've been saying since the fucking Alien movie yeah. that we would do Jean-Pierre Jeunet. more Jean-Pierre Jeunet. We were going to get some more in. So it kind of seemed like a funny idea, right? Yeah. I mean, normally- A little light side, a little dark right. side, you know, a little Normal, happy, a little sad. Normally on this show, we wouldn't give you guys Amelie. Amelie is- No, that's is, probably- It's a little bit too Oscar- Probably too happy. It's a little bit too Oscar meat. Well, it's a little bit. It got shafted on a lot of stuff. Yeah, so but I don't it, want to it say did that. get a lot of. We we would have gone for the underdog. We would have gone for something sure. like Delicatessen Absolutely. or something new like Mick Max. But right. we would definitely not have gone for Amelie. But we just felt so goddamn bad because we don't want a repeat of well, Pie in the Fountain was. One. The I fountain. think we did a couple of those shows yeah. though, and uh, and I, we didn't just want to drag people down. So hey, we'll do Amelie. Little did I realize that when you actually watch these two movies back to back. And the other thing that fucking sucks is last week I came on here and, hey, Amelie Martyrs, whatever. I hadn't seen Martyrs yet. Right. So yeah. I was not aware of what was I about had, to happen. And I was just kind of playing Being along. a douchebag, I believe. <laughs> yeah, that's another way douche to put it. Douchebag isn't even the right. You were an asshole. Yeah. You were just a fucking jerk is what happened. You don't like spoilers, buddy. So, uh, so what ended up happening is something akin to, I would say, Tank Girl and Schindler's List. But yeah. That was just a good show. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was nothing. This is, we've never... I, there's going to be spoilers in the show and then we're going to, we have chapters. It's sure. really hard, man. It's so, really hard. Right. For everybody, I'm assuming everybody who is listening to the show has seen Amelie. If you haven't seen Amelie, you can skip right ahead to Martyrs. <laughs> if you've just seen Martyrs of the Two and if you don't want to go through any discussion of Martyrs, which I guess I don't really blame you. I loved the film. It's one of my all time favorite endings of any I don't film. I don't want to sound like I'm coming on here and saying I don't like the I film know but you understand the the profound Absolutely. reaction. I'm 2 years old on Martyrs. You're yeah. what 5 minutes? 5 minutes. It's been yeah. 4 and a half minutes I think. Uh so it's important that we go into this with a unified front as we always do on mm-hmm. the show. Oh, what we're doing Amelie first. Right? Yeah, we're definitely That's doing the Amelie worst first. part, man. That is just, what, as we watch Amelie I think in my head this is really happy in French, mm-hmm. but we'll do Martyrs second, and it'll be kind of funny because then everyone will see Martyrs and be sad. But now I did that, and 
I don't like being the butt of that joke. Womp womp. So uh, I'm going to tell people this. If they already fell into the trap, then that sucks. Blame Michael. <laughs> but, <laughs> but here's the thing. If you just saw Martyrs and you're, you're angry, uh, go watch Amelie. That's, that's a great that's plan. That's what I'll tell you. Don't skip it this time. Actually watch it because it is, I believe, the only cure for Martyrs. Yeah, at this it's point. great. Amelie's great. Martyrs is great. All, both these films, great. This is a great podcast. Yeah, I don't know if this will be a great episode of our show because I have to climb. Just, okay, so also really quick, we're doing The Fly next week. Just, I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Everybody get on Netflix and order order some fucking children's cartoons or some Pixar or some... God, where do we start? Amelie. This is going to be the most depressing conversation <laughs> two people really have ever bad. had about <laughs> Amelie. Amelie is not just by comparison, but I would say it's a life-affirming Oh, film. absolutely. Not just because of Martyrs sure. on the show, but in general. Although, man, childbirth isn't any less disgusting just because you speed it up. No, it's, it's not terrifying. A, and it, just adding an accordion doesn't make it better either. No, although, you know, we'll get to the accordion, but I'm amazed how many things you can just, you put an accordion over it and it's instantly easier to watch. So having paired it with Martyrs, we are now dividing our audience more than we've ever divided it before. And I'm sure a lot of people who are fans of, uh, no one who's a fan of Amelie besides you or I will enjoy Martyrs. But maybe the other way around, people who, uh, I think a lot of people who come on the show to listen to Martyrs will kind of scoff at Amelie. So, I mean, this is a movie, and, I, you know, you and I have talked about this, so I think we're kind of on the same page here. Uh, this director, and this is so good for us, too, anybody who watches a lot of movies, is such a breath of fresh air. Absolutely. And part of that is, I mean, we don't understand well, yeah. <laughs> French movies. Right. We're getting there. It's a slow learning process. Right. Well, we did Triplets of Belleville way back in year one, and right. that was kind of both The of most us. confusing show exactly. we've ever done. We threw yeah. our hands up, said, we don't know what's going on, but everybody's really French. Yeah. Please email us, and then no one emailed us, because no one understands what's happening in that And film. then we also already hit on Jean-Pierre Junet earlier last year in one sure. of our Killapaloozas. Alien 4, very easy to understand. We sure. knew exactly what was going on there, although at the time, we didn't understand the director at all said, uh, we'll get back to that at some point. We don't really know. And so now we're finally moving into what I guess is the Jean-Pierre Junet film. Don't this forget is... Man on Wire. That's oh, That geez, was my biggest, right. biggest insight into That's right. French people on Double Feature. Our show is just a long string of what we learn about French people mm -hmm. as told by movies, given the, the awful perspective of these, uh, these narrow stories told by movies. And that's something that Amelie is very often um, a, a problem people have, is that it's portraying French life as something right. um, over the top, extravagant, full of wonder and amazement. Yeah, far it more whimsical this, than anything sure. in the Western world. Like it's Willy Wonka and the fucking chocolate factory. Yeah, you pretty know much. I mean? The thing about Amelie specifically, I don't want to get too far off into an all French film tangent because yeah, right. Martyrs alone will let us know that all French filmmakers do not do the same thing. But right. definitely a good percentage of French films that I've seen seem to highlight the fact that everybody's weird and that's okay. Right. Amelie does that great in the setup to the film. Sure. There's kind of profiles of every character. Yeah. A lot of the film is voiceover. Especially that early chunk. And you get a lot of, this is this character, he likes these really idiosyncratic things, he dislikes sure. these number of idiosyncratic things. It builds the character in a way that you wouldn't normally see if they were just dealing with everyday bullshit right. stuff that you see movie film characters deal with. Pay bills, right. nine to fives. Exactly. You know. The stuff that you see film characters have to deal with in order for a lesser film to establish the characters sure. as people. Sure. And, that you know, there's a bunch of excuses for that. I mean, first of all, I'm going to accept that just because that's the way Amelie sees the world. Sure. So that's the way the world Great. really is. You know, everybody in the world is like that in the film. Right. Um, but also, I like that there is there is a man out there, Jean-Pierre, who in this specific film right here, this one film, has decided that he is just going to show everybody as this... Uh, whimsical is the word to go back to, because that is what we're talking about. These small cute, quirky little uh, aspects of people's personalities that we don't see in everyday life. Mm -hmm. Buried within a lot of people. Not all sure. people, as this film would have you believe. Right, exactly. But within a lot of people, there are small hobbies. Uh, you get to know someone, and you find that they have these odd little interests. Sure. Almost everybody. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're going to approach people on the street, you wouldn't find these as readily available as right. you would in a film like this. 
uh, rather than deal with, as you mentioned, the uh, the type of mundane activities that you might find people doing in a more realistic film, he's decided, I'm going to show you the opposite side. I'm mm-hmm. going to give everybody that as sure. a way to counterbalance right. all the films that give no one that. Well, everybody lives as their subtleties. Yeah. Instead of, in, and, and all the normal things that people do kind of get buried beneath all all of the things that would normally be subtle aspects to a human being. Sure. You have people who are completely defined by tiny little things that maybe a person does. A good example, the guy that does the same painting every year. Yeah, right. He may do that every year. You might know somebody who paints the same painting every sure. year. He doesn't talk about the painting his whole life. He talks right. about what fucking bills he had to pay. He talks about the fact that he ran out of milk one day too early. He talks about the sports and the president and the same stuff every boring human being will talk about. In a given scenario. And then the further you get to know him, maybe the more comfortable he becomes around you, the more he starts screaming Renoir and talking about what the people are eating in this painting versus this painting. But instead in Amelie, that's the first thing you get from everybody is their weird, their weird little thing. And that becomes them and they embody that. The things that people live are the secrets, the hidden, the, uh, the stuff you don't get to know. It's a complete inverse perspective to how, you know, life would normally operate. And for me, and this is one of the reasons I love this director, especially lately, we see a lot of stuff on the show that I'm starting to get really good at wrapping my mind around. (laughs) Although when we get to Martyrs, once again, no idea what I'm talking about. But uh, I feel like sometimes I'm rarely thrown off, you know, and other times after I watch films like these. I start to think I'm thrown off all the time. I never know what the fuck I'm talking about. But when we start getting into, we've just gotten so familiar, I think. Yeah. And it's so good for me to blow out the cobwebs like that, to see one of the, you know, uh, seeing Delicatessen, another one of his films, um, really just recently, and having, I'm almost playing catch up because as I watch these films, uh, every single frame all of the detail of it, it's lit in a way that I haven't seen. Sure. The characters act in a way that sure. I don't understand well, them the acting. the coloring, too. The color is always... I mean, this is a kind of a departure from his other movies, and a good one to talk about first, with the exception of Alien, I guess. Uh, but when we saw the fourth Alien, uh, Resurrection was yes. the, the name of it. Um, very orange. Mm-hmm. Delicatessen, very fucking orange. City of Lost Children, very orange film. And I don't mean to dismiss the films as they use these particular colors on another show. I'm sure we can get into the specifics of that. But this uh, just the color palette of this film already sets a different tone. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean about the visual look? You know, it's something different to get accustomed to. The world is I mean, he does it. We've talked off the air about whether or not these films are sci fi. At first, I was going to say, oh, Amelie's different. It's not a science fiction film, like say City of Lost Children. City of Lost Children goes pretty deep into sci-fi yeah. territory, but then you have something like Delicatessen, which people call a horror film. Yeah. And I don't know if uh, that goes into sci-fi territory just because some stuff doesn't operate the same way it would in the normal exactly. world. But in all of these movies, uh, to various degrees, physics, science, day-to-day life, something is off in a a very blatant, but somehow at the same time, a very subtle way. Yeah. Well, and it's also non-offensive. It's not the kind of off that you worry something's going to happen. It's, it's a comfortable disconnect from your normal physical setting. Not like something's waiting around the corner to get you. So like I said, breath of fresh air. And that's really my favorite thing about the director. Uh, You know, in the future we'll get into more director stuff, but there's a lot of ground to cover. This is one of his uh, only movies that's minus Mark Caro, who, uh, who's a cartoonist, writes and co-directs a lot of the movie, although I don't think he's credited on all of the ones he co-directs, but works hand-in-hand hand with Jean-Pierre on a ton of these films, uh, the films we just mentioned. Mm-hmm. A lot of people attribute the lighter tone of Amelie to the fact that Mark is notably absent. Yeah. I think he still had a hand in some of the stuff that happened with the film, but, uh, you know, from the, the handful of his stuff that I've seen at this point, I would probably say that Mark brings a lot of the darker sci-fi, uh, dark comedy kind of stuff uh-huh. uh, to the movies. And Jean-Pierre, you know, when you look at something like Amelie, basically everything that's left, sure. uh, all of the rest of the distinctive style comes from his end. The director also works, Jean-Pierre, I mean, with uh, a lot of the same people uh-huh. on other projects. 
It's not just Mark. I mean, uh, Dominique uh, Pinon is an actor I think you see in every single one of his movies. Yeah. Um, also worked with Ron Perlman quite a bit. Uh, you know, you start to see the same faces over and mm-hmm. over, both behind the scenes and sure. in front of the camera. So maybe it's more approachable than his other films. Maybe there's a different color palette. Maybe it's a lighter tone. But even when we look at the actors, uh-huh. I think we see something very different with this one. Yeah, well, the fact that you're sticking with one person, right. I think, is the strongest. Even for a movie that, as we've just talked about, is a lot about uh, characters. Sure, but but as you mentioned, it's all about how Amelie perceives these characters. So the film's centric. I mean, okay, so the American title is Amelie. It's mm-hmm. fucking about Amelie Poulain. Right. I believe the French title is something like The Exciting Life of Amélie Poulain or something. It's in French, so I didn't even bother to try and read it off of the snowpad here. But it's all centered around... Uh, Audrey Tattoo plays Amélie. Absolutely amazing. Owns the film. Gorgeous, wonderful, not enough good things can sure. be said about she her. she owns the film. The film could not exist without... Oh, absolutely not. Just her fucking facial expressions. Right. The yeah. film would be lost right. without that. She carries the film completely on her own it's all about her perception of the world it's all about eventually it becomes about her doing these good samaritan type deeds yeah but the beginning of the film isn't really about the plot there's no driving force other than amelie being amelie it really uh the movie wants you to get to know the world desperately wants you to get to know the world and to get to know amelie too I mean, we find out and that's another thing you know if you want to talk about the the dark comedy stuff in this movie uh, there's a few moments, but they're pretty fucking dark, and they're dark in a very different way. The mood about it is very different. Uh, it's lighter. You know, in the beginning, we... <laughs> this is always fucked up when I see it. But the neighbor who tells her that her camera is causing these accidents, right. that's a pretty fucked up thing. It is pretty dark, yeah. It's the kind of thing that's not fucked up unless you sort of think about how it would mess a person up. And eventually she gets back and there's a prank. So maybe not too bad, unless you're really thinking about it. But, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. By the time her mother dies, because a woman is committing suicide, you know, they go to the the Mm -hmm. church or whatever, and the prayer is answered with a woman committing suicide onto her mother, which is how her mother dies. Sure. However, this is treated completely lightly. You put a happy accordion over it. Everything's upbeat. Right. Um, Just keeping the mood extremely light, even when you're dealing with uh, a movie that we're making sound as if it's unrealistic. Right. But it's not totally... Uh, people still die. Sure. I mean, it's still real life that we're dealing yeah, well, with. Well, people are dying. People are fucking. I mean, these are human beings. Yeah. The other thing, mentioning fucking, I like the... I'm assuming it's... I'm not going to credit the film for doing this on its own. I'm assuming it's a French thing because knowing what I know about the French culture and I've known a few French people, fucking is okay there. For some reason in the United States, fucking's not okay if you right. put it in your movie... It's immediately a sexual film. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, it's odd that you mentioned that because I wrote that down. The way that, you know, and it almost, I, I'm sure that it's no big deal uh, when the film comes out over there. But as we're watching the film here, you know, here's a girl who's very innocent, sure. very cutesy girl, quirky. But when she talks about sex, I get this feeling like something's wrong. Like yeah. these aren't the same that can't be the same girl who's doing these innocent things because of the Amer- you know it's an american taboo mm-hmm. it's not a taboo in so many other countries so largely it's an american taboo sure. especially in the fucking educated right. world america get with the times it's not that eric and i are uncomfortable with it it's we're not, not used, used to, to seeing, seeing a film yeah. be comfortable with it yeah to talk about orgasms to see a uh, sexual relationship she has to um you know, the the guy that she's after is he works in a porn shop. And every time we go back there, that it seems seedy to, to me. That's seedy. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I told uh, a story a while ago. I don't remember what fucking episode it was on. So I'll just ruin the, the punchline of the story. But do you remember the one I was telling you about the severed dog leg that was found in the, in the booth? booth? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know people I think who it was spun it. when we did spun and yeah. Requiem for a dream. Yeah. All right. Well, you can go back and get the gritty details of that. But we think of uh, these places as shady. They're not the kind of places that these innocent people with, you know, their fetishes are for photography and not even dirty photography, but mall portrait yeah. machine photography. Sure. Well, again, it's it's bringing that quirk thing to define your character. Right, right. Something, a hobby. This could be collecting stamps. Sure. But it's French, it's Jean-Pierre Jeunet, so it's footprints. 
It's photo booth stuff. It's things that the hobbies themselves are all really safe. And if you happen to encounter fucking along the way, that's not a big deal either. People fuck. Yeah, and so when we see him trying to uh, to get out of his job for the afternoon, you know, the woman's in there stripping. I don't know if she's putting on a performance or just having a good time. I don't know what's going on in that room. But uh, it seems dirty. It seems like, whoa, 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 why is he here? This is not the kind of guy that she goes for. But then we remember back to all of the sexual encounters, back to uh, when she gets the two people to hook up, Sure, one of which is Dominique's character, in the in the cafe sure. bathroom. I mean, this is not something that makes her uncomfortable at all. Well, earlier on in the film, we even see her getting fucked, in, yeah. like laying yeah. in the bed. But it's that's kind of an awkward scene, but it seems like she's comfortable with it. Yeah, right. She's smiling. She's giving the Audrey tattoo. I'm yeah, on the right. watch me own this movie look. Right. And some guys, you know, putting it in her and that's okay. It's, it's, it's weird because she's not reacting. Right. It's supposed to be weird. It's supposed right. to be kind of funny, but it's also supposed to show us that she's not a stranger. She's not closeted or something. She, exactly. She, she, cause she was homeschooled, right? Yeah. That could immediately lead you to jump to the conclusion. Well, that's what we think of over here. Sure. She's Sheltered. a 26 year old yeah. virgin. She's, right. she's never even seen a fucking cock. Right. But that's dispelled. We see her getting port. So Jean-Pierre Jeunet knows that this is something that's going to be on at least some people's minds. Sure. Uh, if not everyone's minds. And as you said, you know, there is a layered element to the beginning of the movie where if you don't think sex is a cinematic taboo, then she's saying something about boredom and about her relationships, which will come back later in the movie. If you do think that sex is a cinematic taboo, as they're, you know, they've seen movies over mm-hmm. there. They're maybe not thinking particularly of how is Western culture going to react to this, but they are aware that the, the, the abundance of popular film in the world does, uh, some might say, unfortunately, come out of the United right. States where that is, you know, it's talking more about cinema than culture. It's a cinematic taboo. So people watching the movie need to know this is not 20-something-year-old virgin. They need to know she's a regular person, sort of. She's a regular French person. Yeah, at least regular enough. So it's odd for a Genet film being so heavily carried by one character. Not even uh, City of Lost Children, which is pretty heavily Ron Perlman. But I always remember this, you know, not only the, the titular Amelie character, but I remember this being the works of her as a good Samaritan. But I think some of that is questionable, right? Yeah. Well, we were watching That was the it. whole pair idea, sure. right? Yeah. Good happy time, good Samaritan, nothing wrong here. Mm-hmm. But turns out there are some things she does that I'm not 100% sure are composed of entirely moral fiber. I don't even There's know a, if we're necessarily supposed to agree with that. A little bit of mo- moral polyester going sure. on. Where do you think that comes in? I think the most questionable one, the one that is the least easy to surmise as a good or bad thing bad radio man you got to build up what's the what's the penultimate one the pen (laughs) okay so the penultimate one hey that this is the second to best but emails anyway please emails we're awful we're terrible show terrible vocabulary on this show the penultimate one is the home alone thing where she's setting traps for this guy i would totally agree with that she's doing kind of mean she almost fucking burns the guy to death in the (laughs) one scene but whatever he survives that's fine. The guy is kind of an asshole. Is it ever okay? Is ever is anybody ever an asshole enough for you to break into their apartment and fuck with their shit? Probably not okay, but also not in the realm of things that are. Well, it's sort of seriously messed up. Yeah, the more you think about it, if you if you just deal with it on the if surface, the accordion is loud enough. It's not too bad. Thank you. But I think the the worst thing that she does, and and also possibly the best. Okay, that's why <laughs> yeah. it's that's why it's weird. She writes this letter to this woman saying. That her husband actually loved her and that he died wishing he had never left her. Mm -hmm. This woman who's been scorned and and has gone on for years hating her husband. Amelie writes her this letter and puts it under the guise of this plane that crashed and these letters were lost. So the woman goes and assumes her husband has always loved her and she becomes overwhelmed with joy and her life kind of goes from this, this miserable brooding experience to kind of a bittersweet happiness. Her husband is dead, you know, he's fucking toast, but at the same time she gets to be happy for the rest of her days. Yeah. But she was lied to. She's happy about falsehood. Yeah. I think it's simultaneously one of the best and most evil things that she does in the movie. Uh, I mean, if I'm going to be very strict about this, look, we already covered this on the show. It's the invention of lying, right? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about here. 
you can pull it back a step. You know, that's very heavy. Sure. Uh, maybe we're dealing with something more like, like psychics, uh-huh. right? We talk about psychics, they're fraudulent and... What if they give people, you know, hope? Sure. And it's a false sense of hope. They lie to people that I can talk to your mother in the afterlife. She says, forget about the money. Everything is okay. Eases your conscience. I mean, I'm dead against that shit. And just because I know that Amelie is a great girl with good intentions, Mm -hmm. she's still in this particular instance trying to portray the world in a way other than what it is. But that's another thing that I love about the movie is even when people are doing evil things, they're doing pretty great evil things. Yeah. They're playing tricks. You know, we uh, the the stuff she's doing is mostly not harmful. And in the cases where it is outright lying or fraudulent, I mean, I'm not justifying it, but it's it's more like the in the world of Amelie, even the evil things are not the same type of evil we have here. Cold, calculated, bad decision sure. type of evil that doesn't benefit anyone. There, they still have bad decisions. Uh They still have choices they can make that are very wrong. They still have people in the cafes who hit on the waitresses and are, you know, all around Mm -hmm. bastards, uh, slimy guys. But in the end, everything still kind of has an upside to it. And I like a world where everything has an upside, even the bad thing. You don't want to get rid of the bad things. You no longer have a real life. You no longer, you know, this is getting into a very thick French question, but would you remove all of the bad from the world? And I think people very interested in this life would say bad things are bad, but perhaps necessary to the human condition. Amelie says bad things are bad, but sometimes they're kind of good and okay too. We haven't done enough to upset everybody on this show. So uh, I just want to tell you about one of the greatest fucking experiences ever, if I could just briefly. Okay, yes. And this will get, I mean, we've been building up a a fan base for this show, and frankly, it's just too large. So we're just going to make everybody, we're very concerned that there's just too many people listening. Bandwidth problems, Rob Zombie's been pissed off, he's not getting his show on time. And so I think uh, shows like this, and when we fucking do the fly right after it, everyone will just leave. And that'll make us sad, but hopefully they'll come back in two weeks. The other thing that will make people leave, I have to just talk about fucking Valve for a second. Okay. Can I just do that? Double Feature has to cover iconic images, right? Uh-huh. I mean, that's something we have to do. The fucking gnome. Uh, the gnome is the, the simplistic, you don't take anything away from Amelie, but everybody remembers the gnome. And if you remember back to about the time this came out, maybe a few years after even, uh, it was the Travelocity. Ma- it was Travelocity, yeah, right? Yeah, I believe it was It was, was the Travelocity. fucking mascot, the traveling gnome. And it was just a stupid talking gnome on the commercials who went to different places. Gee, you wonder where they got that from. Better use of the gnome is uh, there is a software company called Valve. I'm going to use the term software company to anger less. They fucking make video games, all right? Back the fuck off. I'm 20-something. I play video games. Fuck you, Roger Ebert. Anyways, uh, one of our listeners, (laughs) Mr. Tim Kaiser, the guy who sent us the Nutrageous Bars, plays stuff all the time online. And uh, me and a couple people were playing with Tim one day in a Valve game. It was called Left 4 Dead. And uh, they have, there is a mechanic of the game in which you carry around the gnome from Amelie. Through the, this is not actually what the game is about. It's about killing zombies. You get from location A to location B and you kill all the zombies and that's just what happens. But there is a secret gnome hidden in the game that you get, uh, you get fucking points, right? That's what happens. You get points if instead of mauling down zombies and you know saving yourself you rescue the gnome from the game so you have to it's a it's you know four people or whatever running around through this whole game all of your teammates are yelling at you a bunch of people you're they're all trying to fend off the zombies and one fucking jackass has to carry around this stupid gnome through the entire it's just priceless it's some of the most fun i ever had hearing people scream at you over the live service on the fucking headset of your tv or whatever Who's got the gnome? Drop the gnome. Mow that guy down. Somebody pick up the gnome. It is, I'm telling you, it borders on performance art. It's amazing. I get my moment before I move into Martyrs, right? Yeah, I mean, no, come you on. Do. That, that's fully excusable. I totally have to give you anything you need before we dive into yeah, Martyrs. Yeah, little pillow, maybe a raspberry iced tea. Uh, what are we, uh, okay, so, <laughs> do you see that? I was ready to close out the show yeah. just now. What are we doing next All time? All right, so Martyrs is a thing that, ha- I, I don't even know, man. Where do we start? Okay, so we're going to go from... French, jovial, Jean-Pierre Jeunet. I mean, we're going from Amelie, the French, what people view as French cinema. 
to what French cinema is doing behind their back. Behind closed door. The seedy underbelly of French cinema. We covered one of the other major films of new French extremism. Especially in the last couple of years. Yeah. We did Drag Me to Hell and mm. Inside a while back. Now we're covering... There's two. There are two major titles Everyone in cites new French talk about extremism. Yeah. And the second one is Martyrs. If you did not like Inside and you have not watched Martyrs yet, skip ahead because Martyrs is far worse. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. It's uh, it's a lot harder to get. Well, I guess it depends on your specific thing that makes you cringe. But Martyrs is pretty amazing in that uh, I wouldn't say it's a mixed bag. It's not a bunch of different things to try and, you know, it's going to hit somebody's point somewhere. Uh-huh. It's just one or two specific things that no one is going to be yeah, okay that's about with. about right. So I guess we won't uh, we won't talk about the French extremism thing too much. You sure. can go back to that show, and I think we go through it pretty thoroughly. But there's something kind of similar happening here with the Splat Pack stuff. Or, uh, you know, we talk about old school American horror all mm-hmm. the time. That's kind of what the French sure. are trying to do. It's sure. a new wave of horror cinema happening over there. Right. That Inspired to... by American film, which yeah, is important yeah. to note. Inspired by and almost to one-up uh-huh. as a way of saying, hey, the French can do something over here, too. It's to say we saw Hostel is essentially what do they're doing over there. you think that's what's going there? on? It's almost as if all modern horror owes Eli Roth 5%. So my favorite thing about Martyrs is that up until and including the end of the film, you have no fucking idea what you're watching. <laughs> nope. And on top of that... Up to including the end and uh, the show that you do after you right. watch the film. But what I love about that is you do not stop watching. No. It's not one of those things where the film gets started and you realize, oh, this is too violent for me. I'm confused. I can't watch it. You're glued. You have to. There's no option to stop. You you either watch Martyrs or you don't. You don't stop in the middle. And especially you can't because of all the fucking layers sure. of the movie. Exactly. Well, that's the thing is the film is told in a ridiculously complex set of layers. Yeah. The first thing you see is a small girl running out of a building. Right. As if that's not confusing enough. You're immediately whisked away to an orphanage where some terrifying shit goes down. Right. And then my favorite part of the film. So you're skipping over the archive footage, right. which is also, man, does this film jump around. So our, something I really like about the beginning of this is that you have a lot of times in movies, uh, something like Feast does sure. this. You get a credit smash cut. Um, a smash cut, is this is just not the place to discuss smash cuts. But it's essentially an editing technique where uh, a scene can build on another by, you know, bra- you see it in comedy a lot. Oh, geez, I hope this doesn't happen. Smash cut, you get the next, uh, the thing happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's used for comedic effect. It's used for horror, for shock value all the time, especially when you go from something that's very pleasant to something that's uh, very, we talked about it in Stuck. Yeah. But a commonly used technique is to do that for your credits. Um, horror does this all the time in a way to say uh, something like The Hills Have Eyes 2, I think, uh, where you have a really perverse opening scene. Bam, The Hills Have Eyes 2. It's to say, look at my giant horror balls. Exactly. Oh, my God. I am a horror film. You just saw a, an extreme piece of horror. What film showed you that? Bam, this film. And Martyrs gets away with that not only once, but fucking twice. Yeah. They have uh, the opening scene of the the girl running, and then they smash cut to archive footage uh-huh. with the credits. So you're thinking, oh, that was the big what the fuck a girl's sure. running? Well, How you're is that? What's going Tom on there? Tom at yeah, that point. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is one thing you could do with a cut like that. And you get the credits, and you think that's it for the credits. But then you get the orphanage stuff, where you end on that backlit silhouette perched on the bed. Bam, title, Martyrs. Sure. You get two fucking smash cuts right. in the beginning. And then right from that, you get one of the strangest things in the film where you see the little girl running and yeah. screaming and you immediately assume you're just picking up where you had left off and sure. the little girl's terrified. You realize you're following some family who you've never fucking seen. Yeah. Nobody from this family is familiar. Granted, you're early in the film. But they're just being a family. Right. They're playing around. They're eating breakfast. They're talking about sporting events. They're doing normal family bullshit. While you're still trying to look for your protagonist. Sure. You're still trying to figure out who this film is about and what's going on. Yeah. Something that you'll be trying to do for a long time. And this this scene goes on for a while, and I, I think it goes on for the perfect amount of time. It goes, it starts and then lets you down. You realize you're not supposed to be scared. Yeah. 
then you watch it and you realize whatever's going on, there is too much bullshit yeah. going on here. The family is talking too much about stuff that does not apply to what you've seen at this point, yep. and something's got to happen. And still nothing happens. And you wait a little bit longer, and the doorbell rings. And at the time the doorbell rings, you're not thinking, here we go, here comes the shit. You're thinking, okay, I guess the film is a little bit slower than I thought. Right, right. You're thinking someone's going to come to the door sure. and maybe shed a little light on what right, you've seen. Right. The, the matron of the orphanage, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, your niece was killed. She, we didn't realize she had family. Something stupid like that. Sure. Door opens and the man's chest explodes. Yeah. Welcome to the fucking party. Yeah, when you spend too much time lingering in a place like that, uh, you get something. Oh, when we talked about funny games, there was another goddamn show that was just, Jesus, hard candy and funny games. Looking back on the greatest hits of <laughs> Double Feature, making people delete this podcast feed. <laughs> but you want to spend a lot of time getting to know the family because they're going to be your survival unit. Fucked up things will happen to them sure. and you're supposed to right. feel. And this is such a play. It's a mom and a dad and uh, fucking two kids, and they're all eating breakfast right. and sharing stories. And you're you're seeing them at breakfast. That's the most comfortable place to be. And you start identifying with them and thinking this is who you have to follow. Uh -huh. As soon as you get the shotgun, I mean, the girl who enters the door is the villain, right? And uh, you know your mind's racing because you've you've seen the archive footage uh -huh. and you've seen the opening. You're, you're putting things together. You're trying sure. to figure out where this girl may play in. Yeah, Every right. time you see something happen, your brain instead of watching goes, "Where does this fit into what I've seen?" Sure, it's a puzzle. Is this? Have I seen this girl before? Was this the girl on right. the bed? Right. What's going on here? But you don't have time to figure that out. She's no. too busy mowing down <laughs> right. a happy suburban family. She's mowing down your answers. <laughs> exactly. And the film doesn't pull punches. Nope. I think I said it while we were watching the film. I stand by it heartily. Why pull punches when you have so many punches to throw? Yeah, uh, just one after another. So, all right, you kill the adults, whatever. That's what's happening uh, in a movie like this. And then you kill the 18-year-old kid. Sure. Make a point of you know getting the name Getting and the age. really, yeah. You do make know it seem like it's hard to do. Yes, yes, absolutely hard to do. But the stakes, Michael, the stakes, the stakes are so high. So we don't know what's going on, but it's still uh, something really bad and fucked up must be at work here for this girl, or she's insane. And by the time we get to the young daughter, it's an afterthought. It doesn't even <laughs> fucking matter. We killed the kid, the eighteen-year-old kid, just to show that that needs to be done. And so when we come up on the daughter, she's just got to go too. You fucking slaughter the goddamn daughter in the beginning of the film. You might think, where do you go from there? And the film doesn't give you that answer either. But what ends up happening, and, and here's another thing I like about the film, is it's, it's fucking with its own genre. Mm -hmm. You've seen kind of a slaughterhouse, violent, it's a really violent, you know, guns, okay? Guns in horror film set a precedent for the type of film you're going to watch. Mm. Usually that precedent is not a psychological thriller. No. But that's the next bit of film you get. You get Lucy grappling with what she saw when she escaped from the original thing. You find out that she killed these two parents because they were the ones that tortured her. Sure. You don't care about that anymore. You're no longer paying attention no. to why she killed the family. You're too busy. You're hung up on this creature that's yeah. stalking around the fucking bathtub. Yeah, there's a thing in the house. What the hell is it? And you don't even have time to question, is that real? Is that fake? By the time you get that answer, you're moving on again. Yeah, right. The film doesn't... It doesn't let you linger anywhere for any amount of time. And not only that, but it gives you the answers you're looking for just past the point you give a shit anymore. Yeah, right, right. The film keeps expanding, and I mean, it expands to the, the greatest expanse anything can get to, <laughs> yeah, right. right? It goes about as broad as it can. I mean, when you jump like that, you want each jump you make to have some kind of impact. Sure. And so the movie plays around in those areas as long as it needs to before you start to be bored. I mean, about the time you say, I think I have a handle on this, but well before boredom can uh -huh. kick in. But I mean, right when you think you have it figured out, it says that that was yesterday's sure, news. Right. Nobody cares about that. You know, the thing is a, a perfect example. They're inside the house. This thing is kind of chasing them. But the way they're treating it, very interesting. As soon as she gets out of the house, it seems like it's no longer a threat. Uh -huh. The other girl goes in the house, not afraid of it at all. What the fuck is the deal there? I, you know, a few minutes later, they're sleeping in the house. They clearly don't care. The thing shows up again. 
And then you, oh yeah, you know what, it, there's a reveal, you know uh-huh. what it is, moving right along. And then you move on and you find out that there's something underneath the house. Well, that's after one of the girls kills herself. Sure. So then my question is, you know, I'm always saying, where is this movie uh-huh. going? A movie like Martyrs constantly questioning where it's going. Uh, once the girl kills herself and you know that the other thing is in her head, where is the antagonist of this film? Exactly. You you find out that there's something weird under the house that should be lingered on. That is something that another film would spend time exploring, spend right. time finding disheveled documents in a yep. room and a, a cigarette butt in an ashtray so you know that people have been there. But instead, you go down there, you head in a straight path, you don't look down any extra doorways, you find another girl, a yep. real girl, yeah. who's in the same situation as this creature you've been running from, and you think the film is kind of winding down. You You realize oh, she's discovered this girl who's in hell here. She's in this awful position. Right. She's going to rescue her. And right about the time you think, wow, she bathed this girl, she took this disgusting visor off of her head. Right, right. Saved her. The girl gets shot in the fucking head. Yeah. Suits run into the room. This is my favorite part of the confusion. Yeah. This is one of the biggest, well, we're fucking switching gears here. I mean, I think even as we get to the end, Never does the movie change so much as that point right there. Right. It's just, that, oh, that character you thought you were spending time with, did you forget what movie you were watching? Uh-huh. Shoot them, moving right. I thought for a second there they were going to shoot Anna and just move on to a totally new set yeah. of characters because it seems like the lineup has been rotating so much. Right. But instead, these suits run into the room, and this is the point where I turn to you and go, we're an hour in, the plot's going to start. Yeah. So... Let's take a moment before we get into the second half of the film, which I'm going to take a huge diatribe about in a moment. Great. Martyrs has kept you watching this film for an hour. Everything you've seen is essentially just to fuck with you, make you uncomfortable, prove to you that the film will not apologize for what's going on. Do you feel betrayed by the end of the film knowing that the first part of the ride is only an emotional setup, but not one for plot? If I had the fortitude, the constitution perhaps, I would watch it again in a heartbeat. Um, You know, a movie that can, I mean, that's why we've been kind of going through this blow by blow, is because it ropes you in so well. How often do you see a movie that you don't know what the fuck is happening even an hour into the film, and you're kind of okay with that? Yeah. You keep moving fast enough that you don't really have time to think about that. I think everything leading up to that point, just beautiful execution. There's a whole section in here that we don't need to get into too much where this girl's being tortured. She's being force-fed what I'm assuming is disgusting food. She's being beaten. I believe we've talked about that on every other show we've ever done, so that's fine. Bad stuff is happening to this girl, and it's awful. It's very difficult to watch. She ends up without skin. There, that's what goes on. That's about all you need to say, right? But what actually goes on here is one of the most brilliant things, and, and this is, I am crediting the French beyond just the film thank you france you find out that there is some elite group of people all old people as we've seen torturing girls because they believe that there is some transcendental property that women tend to achieve when tortured it's a terrible thing to believe but they're cultists so that's and it works yeah in in (laughs) yeah that's the worst thing you could say about it also it works yeah it did yes it did she goes through this nightmare essentially she's a conduit for this other group of people to get what they want. They're pretending that there's nobleness here. They're pretending that she is. They just really want the answer, exactly, right? Exactly. I mean, but, come on. But they're just pretending that, you know, they, they, what, a moment of silence or a moment of prayer yeah, or some right, fucking right. bullshit. As if she's doing them a huge, I mean, in a way she is, but it's not like she has choice. Choice exactly. is the key component, right? Right. Well, that's what, that's why I like the title. The title is Martyrs. And usually when you hear the word martyr, in this film, they define it as witness. That's probably the basic definition, and that's great. But when you hear the term martyr, it's a willing, a person who dies willingly for what they believe. Sure, right. Right? Especially if you think of something like a saint, a religious person yeah, yeah. who's dying for their faith. That's usually what Sacrifice you yourself, make a great sacrifice for other people. Exactly. At your own expense of your own accord. She has no choice. But at the end of this film, all these people get together because it worked. It fucking happened. Yes, it did. Happened. Stop making me say that. Sorry. So this girl has seen beyond. She's not only had a, it's not a near death experience, they point out, but she has transcended 
for over two hours. She knows what goes on after you die. Apparently, that's I, what they're looking for. Right. right? <laughs> Eric and I also know what happens when you die. Yeah, but, we, we covered that in but, a previous But film everybody as well. else in this film is not sure. So what goes on is all these people gather, these people who you know based on the fact that they're all arriving in cars, based on the fact of seeing people like this throughout the film, she's not the only girl that this has happened to. She's no. not the only girl that is currently in this position. It's almost sad because she's succeeded, and you know that there are girls chained up all over yeah, the right. country who are basically, they're just going to have to be killed off like fucking This seems like a huge community. Cattle. They've been doing this for you know a decade or something, 15 years. So they finally pulled it off and the woman who's in charge is supposed to come out and tell them what Anna has told her. Right. The woman shoots herself in the head. Yeah. She says, keep doubting right. to the man who's kind well, of, well, ask him, you know, do you know what happens after exactly. death or whatever? This is a very deep point to this film because it can mean any number of yeah. things. Yeah. It can mean what happens after you die is so fantastic. I want to die now. Sure. What happens after you die makes life so meaningless. Why should I live anymore? Mm -hmm. Another thing that I didn't think about until I'd watched it this third time. We've seen this woman give the speech where she says, look at the eyes. We see it early on before the torture starts, right? Yeah. Look at the eyes. This woman believes more in this than anybody else. She could be totally fucking wrong yeah they say that these girls when they're beaten start seeing things they start hallucinating right yeah who's to say that anna has not just seen some crazy bullshit sure. and this woman just She's talking to, to her believe... imaginary friend exactly. through the last uh end of the movie this woman takes her own life based on her own beliefs yeah. and for all intents and purposes she could be fucking wrong yeah the best part is that she leaves everyone else who's been involved in this to ask the same question that I'm right, posing. Right. And the film doesn't answer it. Thank you, Pascal <laughs> Logier. So I'm going to give you one even better. So I went away aware that all of those were options. But I looked at this as a character story, as any time I'm seeing a, a film where a fucking girl is completely tortured uh -huh. the whole well, time. Well, okay, so these films can also be called Rape Revenge. I think I know yeah. where you're going here, and, and we've gotten past the rape part, which leaves revenge. <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, if I'm going to look at this as a rape, rape revenge film, I mean, this film goes in so many directions. Sure. I think it's debatable if you would call it that. It starts uh, it that plays way, around it. Yeah, right. But I, I mean, as I said to the you. The shotgun scene is revenge. Sure. I mean, you're, you're already right. dealing in that genre. As I said to you when we started watching the film, it's a rape revenge, but the ending makes the film far more legitimate than something like Last House on the Left. Or certainly more complex. Absolutely. So uh, a movie that has shown uh, everything that this girl has been through. I don't need to build it up for you. We've been ta I've been having trouble doing this fucking show because of it. This girl goes through all of these pains. These people fuck with her in a way that uh, people have never been fucked with. Rarely been fucked with throughout the history of time. And uh, in the very last instant, they count on her for something. So I like the possibility that Anna said... Well, I'm not getting out of this situation. The worst things ever imaginable have been done to me. I see what people who get out of here look like. The only way to get the revenge part of rape revenge is basically to tell these people something that would make them kill themselves. So here is this woman. She's the head of this organization. She's the one who wants the secret. I don't know what she told her. It doesn't even really matter what she told her. What matters is you see the end outcome. I think she's fucking with them. I think whatever she said, that was her way of, you know, you see in the end of the movie, just if, again, to look at this as a character story, she has to survive. She has to ignore the pain. She keeps telling herself this. She's told this uh, in her mind. What does she have to survive for? I mean, you could say it's just to see what happens after mm -hmm. death. And that kind of makes this a different movie. And that's a totally a possible direction to go. What's so much more amusing to me is that she survives for the sole purpose of fucking over the people that have messed with her, of making this a rape revenge film, uh, when without that last element, you don't have the revenge. My favorite thing about this ending, I, I said to you this might be my favorite ending of any film ever, it's that you don't know, and the film does not give you that answer. No. You can watch the film a hundred times, well, you potentially, <laughs> no, you can't. No, you could you watch couldn't. the film a hundred times. You watch the film about three times. And there are no answers. The film does not bury those answers 
because they're just they're far too deep and i think the film knows it the film knows that that is a realm well i mean what is it going to tell you you know this is what the afterlife is like uh-huh. and then she walks down and tells everyone what it's like and that's the i mean come on that would ruin the entire fucking movie yeah there's no there's no point there uh, you know, if they if they say specifically what Anna said, you lose that whole layer of interpretation. I mean, this is the only way to end a film that has gotten itself. Uh, so, you know, there are points 10 minutes in, you could end it this way. Uh-huh. Another 10, you could end it this way. 30 minutes in, you end it another way. But once you've gotten yourself to martyrdom, this is, I think, the only out that this film has. And it fucking takes it. All right, it's your job to explain to me. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, yeah, we do. uh, and an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You know, here's what I actually want to know, because we go on about this shit all the time, but our listeners, they probably have more of a stomach than we give them credit uh-huh. for. Uh, I want to know if anyone watched both Amelie and Martyrs. And if you liked them both. Um, yeah, if you liked them is great, too. But I really want to know if you have been turned off at all that we drug you through those movies. If we uh, give you the title of two movies and you blindly watch them, as I know a lot of people do, uh, would you be pissed at us that we that we gave you that experience? Which, by the way, turns out watching these two movies back to back, not a good cinema cinema going experience. Um, but I'm I'm curious people's reactions to that and if they if they enjoyed the double feature itself. So now it's up to you to explain why the fuck we're doing these movies next week. Have we not tortured people enough? What the? Are you just leaning on Amelie? Is that what's happening you, here? You know, the reason we're doing this stuff next week is because I just made you watch Amelie and Martyrs, and I've seen The Fly. I'm familiar with The Fly, uh-huh. and you're telling me Altered States is a movie I need to watch. Uh, so this yes. is this is you doing to me what I just did to you. Uh, the Altered States goes in the category of movies I saw a while ago that I'm not... Mad science, man. You can't beat mad science, Absolutely right? Absolutely not. I'm all for mad science. Well, we'll see if that holds up next week. Great. Watch more fucking film. I'm sorry, guys.